everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode 11 of season five of the Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. Question time, and I get to ask first. Okay, <laughs> Annalisa, do tell. Have your lovely doggos made their online or social media debut? And if so, on this day that this podcast is, is airing, we're celebrating Halloween. <laughs> All the Halloween fun. So might you have a costume or two or three for your sweet doggos? <laughs> Okay, well, duh. (laughs) And I think I'm in this, like, space where even though my pups were the same size they were last Halloween, I had to get them new costumes this year. So last year, Cooper was a cow, and Francis was a hot dog, and they were adorable. And then this year, Cooper is a bee, or a queen bee. Love And (laughs) And to keep that royal theme going, Francis is King Charles. Um, now neither of them keep their hats on very well. So Francis also looks like Wonder Woman, (laughs) but that's, it's fine. It's fine. And with enough treats, they did manage to take pictures and yes, they are on Instagram. And so I think we need to put our Instagrams in the show notes to show up our puppies for this episode. Okay. Same question back at you. Social media, a Luna Halloween this year. Well, okay. So when I looked at the photos I have of my phone, I realized I have more photos of my cat and dog than I have of my children. If my children lived at home, that would definitely be a problem, but they don't. (laughs) There was this dog and cat photos all over, which means they're all over social media, more than anything else. Um, (laughs) But I don't post too, too much. But when I do, it's definitely a Remy or Luna or both. And why is that? Because they're cute and who Mm -hmm. doesn't want to see that? But a costume, I'll tell you what, this cat will have nothing to do with it. Practice today is not going over. Luna's going to try to be the pumpkin that she was the last two years, <laughs> neither of which was pretty successful. But we're going to be optimistic and hope that she can pull off the pumpkin's day. <laughs> nothing is fancying like the whole monarchy thing you've got going with your two, though. <laughs> <laughs> but with all that being said, if I'm engaging with other photos on social media, it's probably going to be the pet photos and videos. I will definitely like all of those for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, I like pet pictures too. I think it might be the thing that gets me to social media. And I mean, isn't that what the internet is for? Yes. I mean, we're not going to give too much away here. But I do think there's a reason behind this trend, and today's guest tells us all about it. We last spoke with Dr. Jess Maddox two whole years ago when her book, Proposal, it was a proposal, it was an idea, it was a solid idea, but it wasn't written at all. So in the second of our What's New With series, we get the great pleasure of checking back with Jess Maddox, an assistant professor in the Department of Journalism and Creative Media, and she's going to tell us all about what she's been doing over these last two years. So a warm welcome to Dr. Jess Maddox. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jess. We are thrilled to have you back. It's great to be here. All right, Jess. So we're going to kick off this episode with a couple quick questions. Um, First, well, we know who you are. So second, where are you from? (laughs) I am uh, a native Georgian, uh, born in Atlanta, uh, raised in the suburbs. um, And then I am a triple dog, meaning I have Mm. all of my degrees from the University of Georgia um where my dogs uh will uh crush your florida gators this weekend <laughs> <laughs> oh this this feels hostile <laughs> okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna deviate from my next planned question okay. and we're gonna go ahead and spoil everything okay your book title is cats 
How yes. did you go cats when you're a triple dog? Oh, <laughs> fair question. That's an absolutely fair question, uh, especially because I uh, also have dogs myself. I don't and you have dogs. <laughs> Um, so it's really funny when I, when I pitched my book, um, and even the proposal I sent out, it was titled, uh, it had a different title. Um, and I had the t- original title had, I, I can't tell you what came after the colon because I can't remember, but the <laughs> first part, like the catchy part was, um, this is fine. And in reference to the famous dog sitting in the fire meme, they weren't saying this is fine, you know, when things are obviously <laughs> not fine. And I went with that meme because that, that's actually how I opened the book is um, doing a discursive analysis of that meme. Mm. Um, and because the meme re- really encapsulates um, kind of the thesis of my book, which is um, the internet's kind of a dumpster fire, but animals <laughs> are situated at the center of it and kind of give us some space <laughs> Uh, for being bearable. Uh, so I had gone with that title. Um, and so Rutgers, the um, press that they sent my proposal out to peer review, said, okay, we love it. Hate the title. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Got to do something, something better or something, you know, a good book title should tell you really what the book is about in the title. Mm. And so I was like, okay. And so I went back to the drawing board and thought about it. And then, well, a kind of colloquial saying is the internet is for cats. Um, that's been thrown around uh, kind of in internet spaces, for, you know, on Reddit, in meme culture. And I said, you know, that would be a really good title for my book because I am arguing not just why the internet is for cats, but how the internet mm-hmm. is for cats. Mm-hmm. So that's what it became. <laughs> Okay. okay, so we've already kind of touched <laughs> on it, maybe provided too much of a teaser, which is perfectly fine. When we <laughs> talked to you two years ago, yes, you had we we were all in lockdown, kind of mm-hmm. full on COVID, not yeah. seeing humans in person, mm-hmm. and so you had told us about this book project. Yeah, and it sounds like it's come to a wrap. But can you explain it- our listeners on kind of? what's been going on with the book project for the last few years, where it stands now. Yeah. So it's, you know, writing a book is, is really crazy because, uh, you know, also maybe just because time is crazy. I'm like, God, <laughs> like, how is that two years ago? Uh, um, but yeah. So I guess last time we talked, I was either pitching, I was in the process of pitching. Um, I, I knew, I, I think directors had expressed interest. Um, they sent my proposal up for peer review, came back with feedback, including about how the, how the title sucked um, <laughs> and I needed to fix that. Um, but they, um, yeah, I signed a contract with them on election day, 2020, distinctly remember that. Um, and then began really writing and, you know, and the research had already been done at the time, you know, my da- data collection and analysis had, had been done. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew how the book would be structured. Um, so then it's, you know, what I tell my PhD students I work with after they do comps that then you've got to, uh, write the damn thing, you know? (laughs) Um, so then I had, I had to write, am I allowed to cuss on this? (laughs) Perfectly Um, fine. (laughs) And, um, so they, uh, yeah, so I wrote very hard and intensely for like eight months, Mm. um, and sent my final draft. Um, of the book to Rutgers uh, or rather a completed draft to Rutgers uh, the week I also moved into a new house I seem to have a habit of like <laughs> stacking very stressful <laughs> life events on top of one another um, but then I um, sent it off it came back from peer review a um, couple comments um, you know thankfully you know Rutgers has it, it's been a fantastic press to work with Nicole Solano my editor um, is truly amazing um, so there were very minimal revisions I had to do because I worked with her kind of from the proposal to the peer review feedback on the proposal to kind of what would make the strongest book. Um, and then, um, so luckily it was, it was in very good shape then to even, um, go out for peer review, came back with just a couple comments, did that, um, and then did the, the part of the book <laughs> that made me crazy, which was so many rounds of, of copy edits mm. <laughs> oh um, wow so many rounds of copy edits like I'm pretty sure I can speak parts of that book from memory um 
just because of, you know, how many times you then go through it. Um, Cause the professional copy editors will go through it. Um, so then they send it to you to check and then you send it back and then they send it to you again with final proofs once it's been formatted and typeset and everything. Um, but yeah, all of that to say, um, it happened, all of that happened. And then the book was officially released October 14th. So uh, last week or two weeks ago, um, and it is out in the world if you, uh, so care to read it. We will definitely make sure the listeners have a link to purchase the book. Um, But I have a follow-up question. For those who are not really familiar with writing a book and that whole process Mm -hmm. beyond the copy editing that you just discussed, it seems like it was relatively quick, but maybe it didn't feel like it was relatively quick. So So is that normal, or can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I think a book um, in general can have a a two to three year life uh, kind of lifespan before it um is published um i i write very quickly um just kind of because of of who i am as a writer um i i do a lot of planning i do a lot of outlining and so that the writing for me then comes kind of very very quickly um which helped (laughs) which kind of helps my speed um along i'm also just the person i was this way as a doctoral student and this way now, if I set a deadline for myself, I'm going to stick to it. There, mm-hmm. like, not meeting that deadline is is not an option for me. So when I told Rutgers, they were like, they because they asked me, they said, what's your timeline? And, I, and that was in um, when I was pitching it in kind of spring 2020, I said, I can have a completed manuscript to you July 2021. Yeah. And it, it, it didn't have to be that deadline. I just set that for myself because I'm insane. And um, <laughs> they even said, um, you can have longer. And I said, no, because I, I want to get it done. If I, if I take longer, it's going to like hang over my head and I, I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want that. So um, yeah, so I, I set a timeline for myself, um, did not always stick to it. Uh, writing, writing is hard. Even when I talk <laughs> about doing it quickly, I definitely hit writer's block along the way. Um, yeah, but then once your book, once you're done writing, you know, then comes all the things like copy editing. Um, indexing, um, typesetting, uh, image permissions, um, kind of all the logistical part of a book, um, filling out things like author questionnaires for marketing purposes. Um, I had to fill out a form on like cover design, which they absolutely crushed. I gave them very little to work with, but I, cause I told them they were the experts. I just said I wanted something kind of fun and quirky. And I mean, they killed it. The cover is, is fantastic. Um, Yeah, so it's a lot of those like logistical things also in writing a book um, that are involved in that process. So Jess, did you always want to write a book? So like, I mean, not like in the last five years, but like Mm -hmm. as a two year old, not maybe not two year old, but like eight eight year old. Like, did you you think like, I'm going to be an author, I'm going to be a professor? What did you want to do when you uh, were young? So not a professor. um, But I was definitely that like, um, so, you know, I was a teenager in the early 2000s. So I was this like, emo kid <laughs> listening to like a lot of fallout boy and my chemical romance and panic at the disco and all of yes. that. and i bring all that up because i was also the kid that was always doing nano rimo or national novel writers month oh <laughs> um so i even before then i wrote a lot of fan fiction oh um i uh will <laughs> never say what my username was or what platform it was on that can die somewhere in the depths of the internet but um but all of that to say like I've always loved writing um between NaNoWriMo fan fiction I mean avid reader you know kind of going along with that um and kind of because of that I actually I went to college um and I wanted to be an English teacher I wanted to teach high school English um because I I loved reading I loved writing um so I was an English major uh, in undergrad and kind of about halfway through, I realized, I was like, you know, not everybody loves reading as much as I do. (laughs) And I then kind of floundered through the rest of my undergrad really kind of lost because I didn't want to, I was like, well, I don't want to teach high school English. Um, and so, no, I did not know I always wanted to be a professor. You know, I don't, I don't have any professors um, in my family. Um, I believe I'm the highest degree earner, um, like a 
across like my cousins and things like that as well. Like we're not a family We're like my parents always privileged ed- education and things like that. Um, but, you know, I had no idea uh, this is what I wanted to do, you know, came into it. I knew nothing about like the hidden curriculum. I had no inside <laughs> perspective. Mm. In hindsight, I was like, yeah, I was just really just kind of flailing along and uh, kind of worked out for me, <laughs> which is great, which is nice. But yeah. OK, so here's my next question for you. Mm-hmm. You love reading and yes. reading, but you study the Internet mm-hmm. and Absolutely. like people on the internet who are not doing right writing mm-hmm. so uh, how, how how'd that happen yeah so <laughs> um a couple different ways I think you know I spent a lot of time um as a t- as a teenager in the early 2000s on the <laughs> internet I grew up with live journal and tumblr mm-hmm. and early facebook uh myspace and I think I just remember being really fascinated by these spaces, even these Mm. spaces where I was writing fan fiction, you know, Mm. back in the day. And um, I think I've always carried an interest in the internet that just kind of even went beyond like just people liking it or not liking it. Um, And so I just, I don't know. I always just kind of had this critical eye and this that I didn't know was called a critical eye at the time, but All of that to say, I'm actually doing a project right now. I have a um, Randall, one of our Randall uh, research undergrads this semester, um, who is fantastic. Her name is Fiona. Um, And she is helping me on a project on book talk or the uh, book fandom part of TikTok. Mm. Um, So we are uh, doing a two pronged project, looking at videos themselves. And then next semester, we'll be doing interviews with creators um, in this space. Um, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a cool project that's bringing a lot of my interests, um, personal and professionally together, um, looking at how reading, um, as a fandom is kind of, uh, shared on TikTok. Okay. So it sounds to me, based on what you're describing, you're spending, Mm -hmm. you have to spend a lot of time on TikTok for research purposes. (laughs) Yes. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) For research. (laughs) Fun fact for all the listeners out there, anybody who studies media at all in any platform, shape or fashion or whatever else, this is how we justify binge watching TV, everything. It's personal. Okay, so the book is done. Yes. People can get it. Yes. What are you working on now? Yeah. Um, so again, the book talk project, um, is something I'm working on now. Um, I'm also writing, I don't know if it's going to be a full paper or an extended abstract for our, uh, big conference deadline, ICA that's next week. Um, but, um, on be real, the, the, app, uh, be real. Um, so for, for listeners that might not, um, kind of fully understand be real or heard of it or you've heard about it but don't quite get it it's an app that's really popular uh with gen z um it sends you a notification once a day and then you have a two minute window from the just take a post of whatever is happening because you only have two minutes and it takes a photo of what's in front of you and then it uses your rear facing camera to take a picture of you and it's kind of hailed as a more quote unquote authentic form of social media since that two minute window really limits you know trying to stage things right Mm -hmm. and it will tell you if you post outside of that window it tells your followers that you did wow um so i'm writing something on be real kind of i i don't agree that it's a more authentic i think it's just differently authentic Mm -hmm. um which is kind of what i'm arguing in this paper and or extended abstract (laughs) that'll get done um so that's one thing and then of course i am also uh thinking about another book but that might actually I'll uh, probably do that and really hit the ground on that after um after I go up for tenure next year so Mm -hmm. yeah how do you how do you organize how do you or keep separate organize all of the different ideas that run through your head at any given moment when you're either writing or Mm -hmm stuff like it, it in in the apps is that what we say um, yes <laughs> yeah um so when it comes to just kind of keeping track of ideas um I have 
a very messy notes app on my phone where if something <laughs> just like pops in my head, I'll put it in there. Um, I also, um, and this was advice I got from my PhD advisor, uh, Dr. A, Dr. Akosko Alzuru at the University of Georgia. I don't know if she, if maybe I'll get her to listen to this since I yeah. gave her a shout out. Um, <laughs> she was fantastic. Um, but she always told me to keep a research journal, mm. um, that there's, it's too much to try to keep it all in your head. Um, mm-hmm. it's too much to try to organize your thoughts in your head and maybe some people can do it. Um, I certainly can't. So I have my notes app and then I have a a more kind of official quote unquote research journal where I write out ideas. I draw arrows, making connections to things um, and just kind of, kind of a space to think, to get it out of my head and and onto paper. But, um, but it's difficult studying social media because I can, you know, be on TikTok just for enjoyment and I'll see something that, sparks my curiosity and makes me go huh I think I want to study that now (laughs) and Mm. kind of then have to make write it down I'd have learned over the years um to not let myself fall into thinking at the moment because sometimes you know it's 11 o'clock at night and I want to go to bed I don't need to turn my (laughs) research brain on um but I'll uh you know I'll put it in the notes app and then revisit it in in the daylight hours Mm. okay so you study social media and we Mm -hmm. also know from you and from our other guests on this podcast that the time to print or the time to publication can be a bit um so how do you how do you stay current because I feel like what's happening now on all all the social media platforms a year from now may Mm -hmm. be totally different so how do you handle that in the work that you do So that's a great question. And um, another thing I heard from professors in grad school, um, you know, and the question of how do you stay current and it's you don't. Um, (laughs) You don't. Um, And that's, you know, what I tell all the the PhD students or the master's students I work with as well is that your your research is already outdated. Like as soon as you bring me an idea, uh, the next day it's outdated. And that's fine. So I think um, the way I approach social media in researching it isn't by looking at specific platforms or, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of made me sound like, but she's been talking about all these platforms. I try to look at the broader things. Mm -hmm. So I very much, I'm always trying to extrapolate out into, okay, so yes, this is book talk. Yes, this is be real. But especially, and I literally just wrote in this thing I'm working on for be real, I literally wrote the life cycle to publication is long. This app may be long gone in a distant memory by the time this comes mm-hmm. through mm-hmm. but so here's why it matters instead so I'm looking at be real but as I mentioned I'm looking at you know changes and how we're talking about quote-unquote authentic presentation authentic online practice more so than the app itself um, so that way somebody you know looking at authenticity can still draw on my work and hopefully find it helpful in the future even if be real again becomes a distant memory so It's always outdated, so you're always trying to extrapolate out and look and use the very kind of narrow to look big Mm -hmm. and to look broad and look beyond the platforms themselves. Oh, okay. So are we are we authentic? No, (laughs) well, no. (laughs) What I tell my students, so and I I teach under our undergrad social media and society class this semester, and I tell them, I'm like, you know, the the doctormatics you get in class is going to be different from the doctormatics if you saw me at Target or. a restaurant or something <laughs> and none of those are inauthentic it's just we're all very complex multifaceted people and we act according to our audience mm. and it's not inauthentic it's just complex <laughs> I'm trying to think of like who who I think who I think my audience who I want my audience to be on social media mm. versus who it is <laughs> and, and oh my gosh I think it's very different I, yeah. I, I think I want um to be a bravo liberty um, <laughs> and I don't think I am I don't think that's who my audience is at that's all okay that's okay <laughs> I just shout into the void on social media but apparently it seems to be working for me so yeah <laughs> uh, it's like that um oh, well h- here is a question sure it, is social media in the way that we present ourselves on social media, is that like the 
dress for the job you want, not for the job you Ooh. have. It can be. I think depending on how people, um, you know, want to use it. Some people definitely do give very, you know, unvarnished looks at their, at their lives. It's like, <laughs> I don't think that would uh, that, advance that's... anything for you. <laughs> maybe, but to me, that's to me as an outsider looking in for them, it may be exactly what they want. Um, yeah, but you know, yeah, we're all we're all performing to some extent. And mm-hmm. I don't think it's a bad thing you know and that's that's why i tell my undergrads i was like i don't think this is a bad thing i think again we're just very we are complex multifaceted people um you know person i am at work is going to be different from the person i am at home with my partner Mm. with with friends and none of those things are wrong or inauthentic it's just different different circumstances call Mm. for call for different things Okay, this is this has been so much fun hearing about yeah. all that you're doing and kind of hearing all that has happened over the last two years. But I, I got to tell you, I'm really looking forward to this next set of questions. Oh, goodness. rapid fire part two, because I okay. think you're going to have some winners. Okay. Uh, no pressure. What's <laughs> um, what is your favorite TV show or what are you watching right now? So favorite TV show of all time, um, and I'll probably get judged for this, uh, is The West Wing. Um, Oh, no. Oh, no judgment. I adore that. I I know Aaron Sorkin is not for everyone. Um, I tell my media kids and like that he's like anchovies. You either love him or you hate him. (laughs) And and I love him. I I adore The West Wing. Absolutely. Yeah. Co-sign on that. Okay. What are you, what are you reading right now? And you can say your own book, even though you wrote it. Uh, I'm absolutely (laughs) not reading my own book. I never (laughs) want to read that book again. Um, Which is the weird thing about writing a book is um, everybody's asking you for all these, like to talk about your book and these insights from it. And I'm like, Oh my God, they're so old. I'm like, Oh, no one's (laughs) heard them yet. It's only old to me. Um, No. um, Okay. So I'm reading. (laughs) I read I read what I call uh, junk food books, actually. <laughs> um, so I am reading kind of a trashy fantasy series right now called From Blood and Ash. And it's really bad. It's not good. I don't <laughs> recommend it. But I'm five <laughs> books in and I can't stop. So <laughs> Okay, so here's a here's a question that's kind of related. If you had a pen name, mm-hmm. what would it be? Oh, I know this one actually. Um, and no, it's not the pen name I wrote pen fiction under. Um, <laughs> but I've always thought I would go with a portmanteau of my middle first and middle name. So my full name is Jessica Lee. So oh. I always thought like a good first name for a pen name would be Jesley. Ooh. Um, and then I would do go with the last name Payne, P A Y N E. And that's only because um, so uh, since I, uh, this is such a side thing, but I, since I chose my last name Maddox, um, for myself, um, I realized, you know, in hindsight, I should have changed my name to Payne. Uh, not really. I really like Maddox a lot. <laughs> um, but I could have then been Dr. Payne, which, oh. is, <laughs> which is so, which is such a, such a missed opportunity. But anyway, so my pen name would be Jesley Payne. Okay. Oh, spell love spell Jesley for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, J-E-S-L-E-Y. Okay. 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 Yeah. So this is, I think, maybe, hopefully, going to be a fun one. Okay. If your life were to be a reality show, or if you wanted to be on a reality show, so it gives you an out, what would it mm. be? <laughs> Ooh, what would it be about? Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think I'm interesting enough to be on a reality show or even be... Um, um, but I think it would somehow probably be about my dogs in all actuality. I don't know. They're more interesting. I think my dogs are more interesting than I. <laughs> I think you're interesting. <laughs> well, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I feel like it could definitely, um, if I was on a reality TV show, I don't know. I could probably be on The Real Housewives of Tuscaloosa. If that was the thing <laughs> I like it. I like it. But I also feel like this would be like, a show that's called My Dogs Are More Interesting Than Me. Listen, Would that's you... not a bad idea. For it's not, a, it's <laughs> not, it, it's, it's a, it's a good idea. Well, it can even be my pets are more interesting than me. And you get like a whole, cause it just me after talking to people for research about their pets and social media, people got some interesting pets out there. So. <laughs> for sure. Yes. Okay. And our final question, if you yes. commit to eating only one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? And it can include booze. 
<laughs> wow, this is funny that I've actually like also put thought into this question before. <laughs> um, French fries. Oh, great answer. <laughs> because they're so versatile. So if I was still limited to only eating them, there's they come in so many different forms that I could basically get out of actually only eating one thing. I like it. Love it. And they're delicious. And they're delicious. Absolutely. Jess, it has been so much fun catching up with you. Yeah, Thank you y'all too. very, very much for um, being our second guest in the Woo-hoo. What's Me With series. Cool. Um, thank you very much. Thank y'all. Thanks, Jess. Bye. Bye. <laughs>